What's up, movie nerds? It's Justin. I'm uh, Nick. Good to see you. And we've just come out of the sequel to Ant-Man called Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yep, it was fun, or was it? Yes, stay tuned, and we will let you know. First up, guys, this is going to be a full spoiler review. So we're going to be saying things that if you haven't seen the movie yet, then maybe you should come back or just watch it because we are some some handsome gentlemen who have just seen the movies and it'll be fun to talk about. So what was your favorite part of the movie? Man, there's so much I can talk about with that man the Wasp I love. But what I love is the fact that much like we've seen so far, this Marvel film has its own identity. Yes, it's refreshing it that we don't get something that is cliche. We get something original, we get yeah. something fun, and most of all, it's self-aware. It borrows from its previous films, yes. the idea of a bit of a heist film, but what we get in here is something new, something fun, and something family-friendly. Very family-friendly. The, 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 the scenes that, like, one of my favorite sequences was right at the start of the movie, where you've got Scott in his house. Like, he's been under house arrest for the last two years because of the incident in Captain America's Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any orange slices? So he's been with his daughter, Cassie, who I think might actually grow up to be an ant character herself. Like, I is there, I, is there precedent for that in the comics? Well, Scott Lang's adventures aren't especially familiar to me, but you can yep. never say never with Marvel because they're always thinking about the next chapter. Absolutely. So, but what I really like this sequence is that. You, because he hasn't been allowed to use the airman suit because it's essentially been taken away from him, he is stuck in this house and he's turned his like house into an ant farm. So he and his daughter are crawling along and trying to do different things and trying to get to a treasure and he's like even got callbacks to Anthony, the original, like the his, his ant friend from the first movie. Um, and that was really, really nice sequence. It was very, very attuned and really good for, for kids. It felt exactly what comic book film should have. A celebration of the imagination, the yeah. celebration of family. And what we get from there, we just catapult right into the adventure because guess what? Hank Pym and his daughter, Hope, walk right back into um, Scott Lang's life. And from there, we are immediately on something fast. We are on an adventure unlike any other. It's actually pretty cool because the, the two-year gap that has um, taken place between the two films, what we have is a, a decent continuation of the story. You don't have to think, oh, what have they actually been up to for the last two years? You know. You know that Scott's been at home, stuck, under house arrest, but you also know that Hank Pym and, um, and Hope oh. have been building this quantum tunnel to try to find Janet. Yeah, and we've never met Jan him until now, but Michelle Pfeiffer, when she shows up on screen, mm. you get a double surprise. Not only is Michelle Pfeiffer looking exactly as she did in the 80s, but most of all, you're going to get a very memorable introduction. And I think this is the second time we can say Michelle Pfeiffer has wormed her way into our comic book fan hearts exactly. as a comic character. Exactly, and it's even the second time that she's worked with Michael Douglas. What, really? Yeah. So let's talk about the action sequences. How do you think they raised the bar from the previous film? As we've seen so far with Marvel Infinity War, all these powers become like a jungle gym for special effects artists. Yes. But what we get with this one is it doesn't matter how big or how small it is, they're going to have fun with it. Um, you know, the trailer shows us this Pez dispenser becoming yeah, a weapon. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. what's really impressive is the gadgets from the houses to the cars. They really, they really, really get into the whole shrink grow cap shrink, shrink grow capability of this tech. That it's not just something that is relegated to just Scott's suit. Now, and and with a couple of those discs, they're using it with cars. They're using it with buildings. They're using it, which I think is a great way to actually move your house. You buy a house somewhere, and then you. You shrink it down, and then you move, and you go, I want to live in this country now. You and by the way, I have my house in my pocket. But seriously, one of the things that stuns me too is the fact that Wasp actually has some really interesting moments yeah. in terms of what she does. Like, she, once she's small, 
you can see her use a bit of martial arts, a bit of everything. It yeah. gets insane. Yeah. And, I, and the addition of the wings really helps in changing the, the visual dynamic of this film as well. Because you've got, um, you've got Scott who's always having to fly around on a... On a creature, on a on a um, on an insect, yeah. and well, I don't want to be racist to the other insects that are out there sure. that aren't being anyway. But you know what? Every good guy needs a bad guy, and we have one of the most unique bad guys that we've actually ever seen, who is more of a a story antagonist than a character antagonist. Like normally, we've got characters, bad guys, who are exactly directly against what the hero has in mind for the film. Like, the whole idea of a, a protagonist antagonist is that it's the opposite of each other. You're always going to have Captain America is going to be standing for this, but then Red, Red Skull stands for this. Whereas in this film, the story is about the family and about Scott and trying to rescue Janet. But then you have this other person, Ghost, played by Hannah John Kamen, and she comes in and she uses her capabilities, which are a massive curse to her. Yeah, the funniest thing in comics is a good tragic villain is the main bread and butter of Marvel. You got Doc Ock and Spider Man 2, mm. you've got Magneto and the X Men franchise. Ghost is a villain you can feel sympathy for because yeah. she isn't just fighting for the fact that she's been wronged by Hank Pym, but she's also fighting for her very survival. Yeah. And in the end, what we have is a film of competing interest but no one is someone you call they're directly evil well except for yeah. one guy Walton Goggins Walton Goggins oh. Oh. I like I, I love Walton Goggins from Justified he's one of my favorite um, character actors that are out there and just uh, his addition into the movie was uh, was really really fun I, I really liked how he was in there I was a little bit confused about exactly why he wanted the the lab they wanted the they've shrunk down their lab that has the technology inside it that will save Janet but then he really wants it and all of his cronies want to help him get it I why did he well apparently he was gonna sell it off you know the yeah. good old bad guy story of if I sell it I'll make lots of money <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah sure. but the biggest it feels like a waste of Walton Goggins in that regard because yeah. he is a larger than life character when he's on the screen as usual if you see him in Hateful Eight or anything else he dominates mm. it but you see this is the one misstep of Ant-Man and Wasp the, even though we have these competing interests laid out and nicely done and we have these characters who feel holistic the undercooked villain for Walton Goggins is a bit of a problem yeah yeah, yeah. it's a shame too because we have a very excellent follow-up for a Marvel film and we have this fun fun villains we have a great cast mm -hmm. so I mean if there's just one thing we could peg wish that a Walton Goggins character turned out a bit better yeah sure what about Michael Pena oh man if you thought he was awesome in the first movie you'd be correct because he's still awesome now exactly the three guys that are um, Scott's uh, old mates that were in the first movie are of course back and they are exactly as they were in the in the first movie. They're just a, a great little comic little sidekick story that's really, really helpful. But Michael Pena does get a bit of an action sequence as well at the end. Yeah, that's a bit strange. Usually the comic relief just stays exactly as that, but we actually have a very fun car chase, which, yeah. you know, actually, to be quite honest, there are two major car chases in there, and it reminds me of Bullet. I mean, of course, you're going to use San Francisco, you're going to yeah. use the hills, you're going to have a bit of fun, and if you love car chases, they go fast and furious in this one. And they do. In fact, in San Francisco, that's where the uh, climax to the first Hulk movie was set. I almost recognize, remember? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I remember like Eric Banner's like kind of like, coming down and, and like Betty, Bro um, Betty, Bros Betty, Betty Ross Bryant. is right there and Liv Tyler. And yeah, no, I almost guarantee that there's a sequence in the film that is shot in the exact same spot. Yeah, it's funny how all these Marvel films are kind of borrowing from each other and exactly. building, but if you have to see Ant-Man the Wasp, is it any good? Yes, it's definitely good. It's definitely watchable. It's definitely re-watchable re as well, which is what I classify a good film. I would like to see this again, and the best thing about it is that I will take my daughters to see it as well. Do you like cats in the films? Because that's all I have, cats. I mean, you know, I could bring my cat. Anyway, look, yeah. besides that, look, 
if you're watching this, you've got a seal of nerd approval from Justin and Nick. Yeah. Ant-Man Wants will be in cinemas by the time this video hits. So if you're excited like we are, hit the movies. Yeah. We'll see you later, nerds. Yeah, we'll see you guys in the movies. Bye!